and um, he, he's written a book, Uneclipsing the Sun, and I think that's available on the book table. But most of what I could say about him you'll, you'll find in, in here in the speaker bios. What I want to say is how much I appreciate his friendship. Uh, Rick has been an encouragement to my heart uh, on many occasions. That began when I met him uh, as I went through the, the doctoral ministry program at Master's Seminary. He encouraged me there, but ever since, he's encouraged me on multiple occasions, uh, not only by his example, but as I said, just his friendship. He's been a good friend to me. I'm thankful for him. thankful that he's a, an excellent preacher, but I also see in Rick um, the love for the church that makes for pastoral preaching, and he exemplifies that. So I'm so grateful Rick's here. Welcome him as he comes to preach the word to us this morning. very kind words, Richard. He is a dear friend and a trusted brother. It's, the longer I'm in ministry, I, I see that the, the value of having men who know you, who love you, who care for you, who can kind of uh, lick wounds with you and, and also rejoice over what the Lord is doing, um, sometimes becomes fewer and fewer. And uh, Richard is a beloved uh, man in our church. He's preached at our church, and people keep asking him, when is he coming back? It's always encouraging after you preach your heart out and they say, when is Richard Caldwell coming back? It's a, it's a good question. <laughs> Never. <no. laughs> We'd love to have you back, Richard. Thanks for being my friend. Those are meaningful, meaningful words. When you read the book of Acts, you find a narrative that is tossed and turned with unexpected Events, unexpected happenings, unexpected conversions, unexpected people. In Acts chapter 16, Paul is moving from Derby to Lystra. He finds his way to Philippi. And as he's there, he's preaching. He picks up Timothy along the way as his partner. He's preaching in the synagogue in Philippi. And in verse 14, we simply read this. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And then Luke says, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. If you want a one verse illustration of what we're going to be looking at over the next few minutes, the doctrine of irresistible grace, it's that. God opened this woman's heart. Lydia was converted because God did something to make her see things she had not seen before and believe things that she had not believed before. And because of his impetus, she was converted and saved. A few years ago, my wife and I had a spiritual crisis in our home. We were watching a steady and escalating rebellion in one of our sons. Now, for the record, I have his permission. I spoke to him yesterday to tell you this story. It's my middle son named John. Without going into the details, we noticed that about 80% of our parenting was going into one of our three sons. He was rebellious, disrespectful, out of control, angry, recalcitrant, and no matter what we did to try to help him, it seemed only to aggravate his depravity. It was a very difficult time for Kim and me. It's about six years ago that it really climaxed. I was about a year and a half into my, my pastorate at Mission Road and was actually considering stepping down because I wanted my, my full-time attention to go into him thinking about leaving the ministry for him. I was surprised about myself when we entered into that season, those difficult years, that I was a theoretical Calvinist. I didn't realize that, but I discovered it in an unusual way. Let me explain. I believed the doctrines of grace. I had preached tulip more times than I could count, around the world, literally, Taught them in our church and churches and 
I'd read the classic texts on Calvinism, read Calvin's Institutes cover to cover. I believed that the doctrines of grace were truly reformed theology that the church should not only imbibe but teach and, and propagate. Our church even had a reputation, it still does, of being that Calvinistic church on Mission Road. But somehow I was able to hold those truths in my mind and preach them from my pulpit. But there was a disconnect of which I was not aware until this event happened with our son, John. Here's the truth. My best sermons had not converted John. Our strictest discipline had not changed his heart, grounding him, taking away his phone, holding back privileges. Nothing worked. My logical and biblical victories over his arguments had done nothing to change his heart. Forcing his church attendance, encouraging his Bible reading, making him read books, pushing him toward our amazing youth pastor didn't do anything. And even our regular father-son coffees were yielding no fruit. I distinctly remember the day we were sitting at a coffee shop. I was begging him to reconsider his life and direction. And this was his words. Dad, I think you need to realize something. Christianity just doesn't work with me. Well, Kim and I were heartbroken. I can't tell you the nights that we held each other and wept until our tear ducts were dry we were spiritually desperate. But in that time, God, in his amazing, unexpected kindness, drew us back from the theory of our Calvinism to the bedrock belief that I think saved our own hearts from despair. And the doctrine that pulled us back to center was the doctrine we're looking at this morning on irresistible, called irresistible grace. It became the gravitational center of our universe. It was a theological awakening. And I think we overstay this and overstate this sometimes. It truly changed our lives. It changed our lives. when We stopped to study and to recall what this doctrine really means. Let's collect our thoughts this morning around the I in TULIP. We're a little bit out of order because we had to uh, rearrange the schedule uh, between Owen and me. So uh, I will be doing the I before the you uh, that Dr. Lawson will do next. Uh, let's begin to acknowledge something. We live in a world characterized by a crisis of definitions. It can probably be illustrated as clearly as anything with a sitting president who said, that depends on what the definition of is is. It's particularly true of theological classifications. I'm often asked questions like this. Rick, are you a dispensationalist? Are you a cessationist? Are you a Calvinist? I've learned over the years not to be so quick to give an answer without first saying, can you tell me what you mean by asking that question? Because often the caricature that's in their mind is not the truth of the scriptural definition for these categories or these theological taxonomies. By the way, I am Calvinistic, and I am dispensationalistic, and I am a cessationist, just for the record. <laughs> I'm so grateful for the ground that's been gained in recent years regarding the sovereignty of God and salvation. I have witnessed in the last 20 years of my own life a, an almost revival and rebirth of Reformed theology. I'm so thankful to God for that. Each of the so-called five points of Calvinism, by the way, suffer from a lack of proper definition. And I know that from my own testimony. Growing up in a very uh, Arminian Baptist church, I didn't know that it was Arminian at the time. I didn't even know who Arminius was or what that meant. But I just knew that anyone who believed in election and predestination misunderstood the Bible. <laughs> That's what I was taught. That's what I grew up junior high and high school believing. It's this lack of biblical precision, I think, that leaves these theological pillars vulnerable unless we have conferences like this, unless we have times like this where we can really recollect our thoughts around what does the Bible say about these critical and key doctrines. 
Richard, thank you for your vision for doing this at this time with this people on this issue. Critically important. As much as any of the points in the T-U-L-I-P, tulip, the I, irresistible grace, may be the most wildly misunderstood. And I think history proves it's been the most wildly misunderstood. So the place we're going to begin is by defining what we mean and what we don't mean by this doctrine. And then we'll conclude with implications on the doctrine of evangelism. It's going to be a topical sermon. I'm always aware when we have a topical, uh, when I do a topical sermon of the words of, of uh, Walt Kaiser, who said, every preacher ought to preach a topical sermon once a year and then repent. So <clears throat> I will repent tomorrow. So we're going to look at three necessary perspectives for understanding the doctrine of irresistible grace. Three necessary perspectives, if you want an outline, three necessary perspectives for understanding the doctrine of irresistible grace. We're going to look at the confusing caricatures of the doctrine, the biblical definition of the doctrine, and then enthused evangelism because of the doctrine. Let's look first then at confusing caricatures of the doctrine of irresistible grace. Number one, confusing caricatures of the doctrine of irresistible grace. We need to first understand that this term irresistible grace was not originated by Calvinists. It was actually a mocking term popularized by the Armenians, sometimes called the Remonstrants, who were the, uh, uh, the Dutch reformed Armenians who were the most vocal and the most articulate about Armenianism. But they actually borrowed it from, um, uh, from the Jesuits who were fighting back against the reformers during the Reformation. They put their anchor down, calling it irresistible grace, in the Synod of Dort in 1618 and 19. And the term stuck really as, as a mocking term, not an endearing term. You'll remember, I, I wish we had the time to go into the history of Calvinism, that the reason we have five points was not because we articulated, we, I wasn't there. The, the reformers articulated five points. They were responding to five criticisms. Dutch reformed theologian who is right in the thick of this, Henry, uh, excuse me, um, Herman Bavink said this, and this is a, it's a full paragraph, but I think it's worth us listening to. He says, The term irresistible grace is not really of reformed origin, but was used by the Jesuits and the Remonstrants to characterize the doctrine of efficacy of grace as it was advocated by Augustine and those who believed as he did. The Reformers, in fact, had some objections to the term because it was absolutely not their intent to deny that grace is often and indeed always resisted by the unregenerate person, and therefore grace can be resisted. Therefore, the preferred way to speak of the efficacy is of the efficacy or the insuperability of grace, interpreted by the term irresistible, in the sense that grace is ultimately irresistible. He goes on, the point of the disagreement accordingly was not whether humans continually resisted and could resist God's grace, but whether they could ultimately, at the specific moment in which God wanted to regenerate them and work with his efficacious grace in their heart, that then they could reject God's grace. His answer is, that's absurd. He preferred if the reformers, he, he actually tried to change from it being irresistible grace. He wanted to call it invincible grace or unconquerable grace. Both are great terms. But ultimately he would admit that in the moment of salvation, grace is not resistible. There's a problem with that term irresistible grace because... We see clearly in the scriptures, some people do resist grace. Matthew chapter 11, verse 21. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For the miracles, had the miracles occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades, for if the miracles that occurred in Sodom had occurred in in you, it would have remained to this day. He's saying, look, you're seeing the best of God's revelation ever. The son of God performing miracles and speaking the word of truth and you're rejecting it. You're resisting it. 
More specifically, Acts 7, 51, you are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and, and ears, and listen, are always resisting the Holy Spirit. It's not that a person chooses to resist. You heard last night, we are born resisting. We are born with a stiff arm in God's face. We are not Thomistic, that comes from the, uh, the uh, adjective of Thomas Aquinas. Thomistic theology says that man is born morally neutral and can choose right and wrong, good and bad, heaven and hell, God and Satan. No, we're born broken, bent. Just as Dr. Lawson said last night, of all the lessons we teach our children, we never have a time when we say, okay, today we're going to learn how to sin. It comes Someone once told me it was great parenting advice. You can't do anything to mess your kid up. They come that way. It's very true. So we understand Bavink and, and the reformers' objection to the term, but we're going to use the term because ultimately it is irresistible and I, I'm okay with that. Part of the reason this doctrine has been so caricatured, so misunderstood, is the same reason that you'll hear about next is regarded to unconditional election. Namely, that if you believe God is absolutely sovereign, then believers are no longer responsible to evangelize and unbelievers are no longer responsible if they go to hell. We're gonna deal with that objection in a moment. Those who do object to irresistible grace most often do so because they want to protect a myth. You heard it last time in both sermons. The myth is called free what? Will. Man does not possess free will. You will find it in no Bible reference. You will find it in no, no verse. In fact, it's just the opposite. Romans 6 tells us about our will. We are born as slaves to sin. We are not free, we're slaves. The opposite of Freedom is slavery. And we are slaves, Paul says, to sin. We're not morally neutral. We don't have a choice because we're born broken. We're born sinful. We're born recalcitrant. We're born with, remember what we heard last night? Open-throated graves that regurgitate sin. In salvation, God overcomes our sinful wills he breaks the slavery and makes us willing believers. Anthony Hokema says this, in reply to the contention that God violates our wills in regeneration, we may say that since we are by nature dead in sin, our wills need to be renewed so that we may again serve God as we should. God's action in regenerating us, therefore, is no more violation of our wills than is artificial respiration applied to a person whose breathing is stopped. It's a great insight. If my breathing stops, please apply artificial respiration. The idea of the irresistible grace means that God coerces people into believing him against their will could not be farther from the truth because their will is already bent against him. And by the way, if anyone tells you this old Southern thing I used to hear growing up, God brought me to him kicking and screaming, then it wasn't God who brought you because he changes your will from rebellion to rejoicing, from running away to running toward, toward. And we'll see that more clearly in a moment. Packer says, grace is irresistible, not because it drags sinners to Christ against their will, but because it changes men's hearts so that they become most freely willing to believe his grace. So we have to first say that there's a caricature. There's a caricature. I understand that it's, that uh, people resist, but ultimately God breaks our natural resistance to him and to the gospel when he causes us to believe, which brings us, number, number two, to the biblical definition for the doctrine of irresistible grace. We've seen the confusing caricatures of the doctrine. Now the biblical definition for the doctrine of irresistible grace. We have to remember where we start. Um, the reformers were so uh, wise to begin with the T, total depravity, I'm glad that Dr. Lawson began there last night to tell us that we are born 
totally depraved, not as depraved as we ever could be, but broken in every way that would make us citizens of hell and deserving of that eternal punishment. It's not only that our wills are bent and we're broken. It's even worse than that. Paul told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 4, the God of this world, verses 4 to 6, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So add to all you heard last night about total depravity, that there is a satanic, demonic conspiracy to hide the truth away from us. That's double jeopardy. That's bad news. That is, we're dead and hidden from truth. I love how it goes on. We don't preach ourselves. We preach Christ Jesus, Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. And then one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. Think about, listen to the depth of this verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, speaking of the creation, light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. All that could be known, all that should be known, about God is in the face of Christ. John 14, if you've seen me, Jesus said, you have seen the Father. We heard last night, Ephesians 2, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Also, as Richard said, that stacked upon the prince of the power of the air dominating the way we think and the way the gospel is hidden from plain sight. Let me expand on the illustrations that you did here already. We are not only blind men in an art gallery and deaf men at a symphony, we are like trying to, we're like an FM signal trying to invade an AM transistor radio. Now, if you're like under 25, just work with me. You're not going to understand that. (laughs) like picking up an FM signal, let's say it this way, with an AM transistor, uh, without a battery. And every wire has been cut. And the knobs have been broken off. And the radio is in Houston. And you're on the moon. And you're dead. (laughs) That's how easy it is to turn on that radio and pick up that signal. The question answered in irresistible grace is this, what God will and what God can do about his, this predicament that we find ourselves in, being slaves to sin, dead in our sin, hidden from the gospel because of the satanic conspiracy. What will God do? Romans 5 verse 6, while we were still helpless, At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. This this illustration is so vivid in Paul's mind. He's saying, listen, um, it's, it's a noble thing for someone to die for another person. You push someone out of the way of a bus, you get hit, and you die, what a noble thing. The, the man dives on the grenade in his, in his barracks and saves his friend by absorbing uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the shrapnel himself. What, what a noble thing. Paul says, what a good thing. It is a good thing for you to die for your friend. And then he tells us this, but you know what? God didn't die for his friends. God doesn't love like that. God did not dive on the grenade to save his friends. That's not the way he loves He says, but unlike the man who would die for his friend, but God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were not friends, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much much more than justified by his blood, we're saved from the wrath of God through him. How do we know that God loves differently than people do? Because he says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. What a God. There are some terms we need to associate, by the way, if you're going to read texts, and I would strongly suggest you read texts on this subject. 
um, that are synonyms for irresistible grace. One is um, effectual calling or efficacious calling. That's distinguished from a general call. The general call is God pronouncing the the, uh, gospel to the nations, to anyone who will hear. The efficacious call is always efficacious. It always works. Those who God calls to salvation always respond to his efficacious call. That's the very definition of it. Demarest theologian says this, in the New Testament, efficacious calling or effectual calling is an internal spiritual event that focuses on the individual. The verb to call or calling, clase, is now that now refers to the effective, listen, evoking faith, evocation of faith through the gospel by the secret operation of the Holy Spirit. Those in time effectually called to a relationship with Christ are identical to the number of elect believers, those who were chosen in eternity past by grace. So this irresistible grace and what you'll hear next in unconditional election work hand in glove. The Westminster Confession of Faith, sometimes it's just good to go back and see what those Westminster divines said about these things. Section 10.1, all those whom God hath predestined unto life and those only he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time effectually to call by his word and by his spirit out of the state of sin and death by which they were nature to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ, enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God taking away their heart of stone and giving them a heart of flesh, renewing their wills and by his almighty power, determining them to that which is good. And lastly, effectually drawing them to Christ. So they come most freely, being made willing by his grace. I like how Matthew Barrett says it. The term irresistible grace can be used synonymously with that of effectual calling. And then he says this, one could just as easily say, God irresistibly calls as saying he has effectual grace. I like that. You heard the term last night, monergistic. Richard was talking about monergism, mono, solo. Uh, 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 the, the central part of that word comes from the Greek word aragon, means to work. One works. Synergism is to work or cooperation. You've often heard that we, uh, justification is monergistic. It's all God. Sanctification is synergistic. We cooperate with God through our obedience and his work through us. It's a mystery we'll never be able to solve this time of heaven, this side of heaven. Irresistible grace is monergistic regeneration. Completely God. Psalm 115, our God is in the heaven and he does whatever he pleases. Can we just marinate on that for one minute? Our God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. Significant text was given to Moses in Exodus 33, 19. God says to him, remember, this is the cleft of the rock scene. And he says, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will be compassionate on whom I show compassion. Paul picks this up in Romans chapter nine, uses it as a theological foundation to answer the question of why did God choose Jacob over Esau? And the text makes the point before they were born and had done nothing. And how could God close and harden Pharaoh's heart? His answer to those questions is, I will show compassion and grace on the one to whom I choose. This brings us to really a significant text, and I'm just going to briefly allude to it. An effectual calling is Romans 8, verses 28 to 30. It's often called the golden chain of salvation, the ordo salutis of the divine decrees. That's just Latin for order order of salvation. Richard mentioned this last night. This is important. 
This is really important. I, I was having a discussion with my, my freshman in college son uh, two weeks ago before he went back to school. And he just says, Dad, which comes first, faith or regeneration? And I just smiled and said, my work is done here. <laughs> as long as he gets the answer right. <laughs> and we had a great talk in Romans 8. It is as clear as a clarion bell. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. He's gonna expand on that idea of called in a moment. For those whom he foreknew, eternity past. We're going way back before the world began. Foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So this, this idea of sanctification is built on justification, which was built on election and foreknowledge before the world began. So that he would be the firstborn of many brethren and those whom he predestined, here it is, he also called. There's the efficacious call. There's irresistible grace. And the ones he called, he justified. These he justified, he also glorified. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And guess what? Guess what? That is not of who? Yourselves. It is a gift of God. Irresistible grace is irresistible because it effectively dissolves a sinner's natural born inherent resistance to the gospel. We can say it this way. It breaks the stiff arm in God's faith, face with which we were born. The classic definition has been given by Bruce Ware. Let me just read this to you. When Calvinists refer to irresistible grace, they mean to say that the Holy Spirit, listen, is able when he so chooses to overcome all human resistance and so cause his gracious work to be utterly and effectively and ultimately irresistible. In salvation, in soteriology, the doctrine of irresistible grace refers to the Spirit's work to overcome all sin-induced resistance and rebellion opening blind eyes, enlivening the hardened heart so that sinners understand and embrace the gospel of salvation through faith in Christ. Such is the grace with which we are saved. May all honor and glory be given to God alone for such a wondrous salvation. Great words. Piper says it this way. Irresistible grace means that the, the resistance that all human beings exert against God every day is wonderfully overcome at the proper time by God's saving grace for undeserving rebels whom he chooses freely to save. So you understand the doctrine? Irresistible grace is God's effectual calling. Those who he calls, he saves. It's not a, it's, there's a general call that goes out to anyone who hears the gospel. Those who God calls to himself will always respond to that call because he removes the recalcitrant resistance to the gospel. He removes it. He makes us willing to believe. Now we need to explain that more in light of our our reason that we're here this, this uh, weekend with our third necessary perspective for understanding this doctrine. We looked at confusing caricatures of the doctrine, biblical definition of the doctrine, and now thirdly, enthused evangelism because of this doctrine. Enthused evangelism because of this doctrine. Now, to be honest, this is the point that most of our Arminian friends will push back against us and say that to believe in Calvinistic doctrine leads to a lethargy uh, to evangelism. And not only a lethargy, it's a let go and let God. If they're elect, they're gonna go to heaven anyway. What do I have to do with God's work? If it's all God's work, if it's monergistic, then what do I do? Nothing, just let go and let God. That's the accusation. And I would argue it's just the opposite. I think the most definitive argument against an Arminian perspective is ultimately attuned to simple intuition. You were given a book in your, 
bags that I, I strongly suggest I would beg you to read and not just put it on your shelf. shelf. Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. I am right. That was given out right. In fact, I was reading that again this week, and I just thought, I'm, I don't, I'm just going to go ahead and read this chapter. It's a lot, lot easier and better than what I would say. When I read this, I read this book. It was given to me by another friend named Rick, Rick Anderson. Recently after I, in my first year in seminary, when I, I began to say, I think election is right and Calvinism is right, after having been taught my whole life that they were so errant. And he gave me this book. And uh, he was a senior in seminary. I was a freshman, a first year student. And, and he said, Rick, I want to give you this book on one condition. I was a young seminary guy. I want books. What's the condition? He says that you read it. Okay, this week. Well, that's like putting you know, your finger in the bony sternum of, a, of an athlete and say, you can't do this. So I read it that week. You've heard this so many times. Books don't change your life. Paragraphs do. <laughs> Unfortunately, you have to read the whole book to find the paragraph that changes your life. And it's not the same paragraph for everybody. Or we would write paragraphs instead of books. <laughs> this was that paragraph that ultimately convinced me intuitively of the truthfulness of Calvinism and God's sovereignty and salvation that was so obvious it was undeniable. And it was so simple, it had been right in my face since the day of my conversion when I was 16 years old. This is what Packer says. Quote, you pray for the salvation of others. In what terms now do you intercede for them? Do you limit yourself to asking God that God will bring them to a point where they can save themselves independently of him? I do not think you do. I think that what you do is pray categorical terms that God will quite simply and quite decisively save them, that he will open the eyes of their understanding, soften their hearts, renew their natures, move their wills to receive the Savior. You ask God to work in them everything necessary for salvation. You would not dream of making it a point in your prayer uh, that you are not asking God to actually bring them to faith because you recognize that it's something he alone can do. Nothing of the sort. When you pray for unconverted people, you do so in the assumption that it is in God's power to bring them to faith. Can I say that again? When you pray for unconverted people, you do so in the assumption that it is in God's power to bring them to faith. You entreat him to do that very thing. Your confidence in asking rests on the certainty that he indeed is able to do what you ask. And so he is. This conviction which animates our intercessions is God's own truth, written on your heart by the Holy Spirit. In prayer then and the Christian is at his sanest and wisest when he prays. He had to throw that in there. You know that it is God who saves men. You know that what makes men turn to God is God's own gracious work of drawing them to himself. And the content of your prayers is determined by this knowledge. Thus, by your practice of intercession, no less than by the giving of thanks of your own conversion, you acknowledge and confess the very sovereignty of God's grace. That's pages 18 and 19 in your book. Why would you ever pray for God to save someone if he doesn't have the power to save someone? Wouldn't honest Arminianism say something like this? God, would you just... Never mind. God's effectual call is not problematic for our evangelism. It guarantees it. Now, we're going to do something very fast, very fast. For a moment, would you turn over to John chapter 6? Because when we get into these deep waters, the obvious question is, well, 
then what place does faith play? If God's grace is irresistible, yet we're commanded to believe, how do those come together? Um, You can write these down. You can maybe take a pencil and note them in your your Bible. I want to show you what Jesus did in synthesizing and making a confluence between the responsibility to believe and God's absolute sovereignty in the same sermon to the same group of people. Verse 44. Ah, let's go back to, um, uh, we can start. Let's go to 35. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. So what do we do? We come to him and believe. You don't check at the door to see if you have the secret Calvinistic tattoo or you know the Calvinistic handshake. Do you know you're elect? You know you're predestined? Well, then, then you're in. No, no, you believe. But then verse 37, all that the Father gives me, Jesus says, will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. Complete sovereignty of God. Verse 39, this is the will of him who sent me that on that day, All that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. Absolute sovereignty. Verse 40, for this is the will of my father that everyone who beholds the son and believes, man's responsibility, in him will have eternal life and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Verse 44, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. Verse 47, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Verse 51, I am the living bread came down out of heaven. If the elect, the predestined, the called, what does he say? Here's the general call. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. Verse 63, it is a spirit who gives life. Verse 65, For this reason, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. Verse 66, what's the response? You know, we think that this pushback against Calvinism is recent. Right after Jesus says what he says in verse 65, no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. Verse 66 says, as a result of this, what he just said, many of his followers is a better term there. The people who are following me around withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Do you think our generation is the first to have a resistance to God's sovereignty and salvation? Don't let this be confusing about man's responsibility. The Bible teaches that man is responsible to hear and believe. How do we know when they're elect? because we tell them the gospel and they do so. What do we take away from this for evangelism? If God calls efficaciously, if it's completely his prerogative, if he alone can can open the eyes and open the ears and soften the heart for belief, then why, how, what for should we evangelize? Let me give you about three takeaways that I have jotted down from my own heart. First is this, irresistible grace, or you can say effectual calling, encourages evangelism and missions. It encourages evangelism and missions. Passage Richard read last night, I have people in that city. We know that the elect are out there. We get to go find them. Just for a moment, I know that Dr. Lawson is going to, I think, treat us to Romans chapter 9. Can I show you something in Romans 9, 10, just for a a, a quick second? I taught through Romans in our church, and it was uh, was the most life-changing study I've ever done. And when I finished, I went home that night and wept because I felt like I was letting go of an old friend. And I wanted to start over in verse one the next week, but the elder said, it's been five years in Romans. I think it's time for something else. Romans eight, you have the golden chain of salvation. Romans nine, you'll hear is the sovereignty of God in election and predestination. But listen, after Romans nine, Richard alluded to this last night, look at Romans 10. Romans 10, 
Brethren, my heart's desire. Tell me if this sounds like a blind Calvinist and a heartless predestinationist. Paul says, my heart's desire, my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. Here it is. For not knowing not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, here it is, to everyone who, what? Believes. Paul was not a heartless, predetermined Calvinist. The same Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 says, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. In verse 20 of that chapter, we beg you to be reconciled to Christ. We beg you. Does that sound like someone so tripped up on God's sovereignty that his heart is not engaged in the care for souls and the faithful proclamation of the gospel and evangelism? Not at all. Look at Paul's missionary life and you will know that his Calvinism, if we can say it that way, his belief in the sovereignty of God and salvation motivated his evangelism, motivated his missions. It didn't diminish it at all. Why? Because we are assured that God has elect that we get to find and identify as they believe. Now, God's sovereignty can certainly work on the conversion of a soul if someone picks up a Bible and reads it and believes the gospel. No question. Romans 10 also says, how will they hear unless a preacher goes? And that, that's not someone who stands here. That's a proclaimer. Someone goes and tells them the good news. God has promised to save some. In evangelism, he actually invites us into that process by sharing the gospel. I'm gonna just do the second one very briefly, another takeaway. Irresistible grace does not give an unbeliever an excuse. Well, it's almost like my son said to me, Christianity doesn't work with me. I'm not elect. I had, had a friend tell me that uh, just recently. I, I guess I'm not elect. 1 Peter 2.8, which some see as the most difficult verse in the New Testament. I think is actually one of the clearest. Jesus is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense for they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, human responsibility. And to that doom, they were also appointed divine sovereignty. No one will ever say when they get to heaven, I'm here because of me. No one will ever say when they go to hell, I'm here because of God. It'll be all in them. And a third takeaway, this is really the sweetest part. Thirdly, the doctrine of irresistible grace grants us or gives us comfort. It's such a comforting, assuring, counseling doctrine gives us confidence. It gives us comfort. Jesus instructed us not to be discouraged, by the way, when people don't receive the gospel. We don't have the time to to go into this. I'm I'm preaching through Mark right now. I was shocked to look at the numbers in Mark chapter four in the parable of the soils, where basically, if you boil it, you remember the parable of the, the four soils. Three of the four soils are unconverted. Only one fourth are properly responding to the gospel. In that passage, he quotes the end of Isaiah 6, where Isaiah says only one in 10 will believe. Now, I don't think that's teaching exact percentages, but it is teaching that people who respond are in the massive, overwhelming minority against people who don't respond. I think Jesus was saying to the disciples, to us, You're gonna go out, there's gonna be a lot of soils. Isaiah was saying only one in 10. Don't be surprised if you tell people the gospel and more people than not say no. Matthew 6, few there be that find it. And yet 
Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 5, do the work of an evangelist. If believing, if faith were up to you and me, no one would ever believe the gospel. So can you be comforted in that? If you accurately tell someone the gospel, no one will ever go to hell and say, well, if Rick had had been clearer, Remember this too, you don't know where you are in a person's life. Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I planted, Apollos, he watered, but God caused the growth. Don't give up. Don't give up on anyone. You don't know where you are in God causing their growth. He can redeem a thief on a cross. He can redeem people outside of your influence. We get to be, not we have to be, we get to be cooperators in God bringing the elect into his kingdom. What's the real problem with believing? Our real problem rather with believing and leaning on God's sovereignty and salvation? Why do we have trouble with this? Remember I told you that uh, books don't really change your life. Paragraphs and sentences do, yeah. Well, I read a a, a little tractate, a a sermon years ago by Horatius Bonner called Man's Will and God's Will. One sentence in 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 the whole tract, one sentence. Here it is. Man's dislike at God's sovereignty arises from his suspicion of God's heart. Is that humbling? Our our dislike at God's sovereignty is we're suspicious that God's not good, that God doesn't care, that we love our loved ones more than he does, that God's concerned with Afghanistan and Pakistan, but he's not concerned with my household. Are you suspicious of God's heart? Psalm 119, God is good and does good. Kim and I were at, at the end with our son. We didn't know what to do. We had sought counsel. I considered stepping down as a pastor. We had read books. We'd gone to conferences. Then five and a half years ago, Johnny attended our annual summer camp. I was preaching there along with Justin McKitterick, a good friend of mine. I I preached the first two days, had to get back to to church for our Sunday worship, and Justin stayed on to preach the weekend. That one night, the Saturday night, Justin was preaching on the broad and the narrow way in Matthew chapter 7. About 11 p.m. on a Saturday night, my phone rang, I've learned that when your phone rings as a pastor late at night, it's typically not the Krispy Kreme delivery man. <laughs> it was John. He said, Dad, can you put Mom on speakerphone? I said, sure. My first thought is, what has he done? Do I have to go pick him up? Then with tears, he said, Dad, I'll never forget this. Dad, I give up fighting God. I really want to follow Jesus. I'm not sure I know how, but I want to repent of my sins. I'm afraid I won't do it right. Will you help me? God saved our boy that night. Apart from me, and I think in many ways in spite of me. That night, my doctrine moved from theory to reality. 
Listen, friends, don't give up on anyone ever. Keep begging them to be reconciled to God. Take full advantage of the access we have to ask God, the great Redeemer, to effectually call others to himself. Wesley, long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's light. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. Woke the dungeon flame with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. And I rose, went forth and followed thee. Irresistible grace gives us confidence, counsel, perspective, and comfort because it's his work and he invites us to be a part of it with him. What a gift. What a gracious God to allow us to cooperate in the identification of the elect. Let's pray. Father, you know my heart. I actually hesitate to give the good ending to the story of my son because I know that there are no doubt many parents who are brokenhearted over children, spouses, loved ones. Our only hope is in you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the relief. The salvation is not up to us. And equally, we say thank you for giving us the invitation to cooperate in sharing the gospel and taking the, the good news to the nations. What a gift. What a gift. What a God. Use this weekend to rearrange our thinking, to correct our theology, and to motivate the glorious privilege of telling people how they can be reconciled to you through the cross and the resurrection of your son. We pray this because of our access to you in him. Amen.